talking with Dr. Payush Danuka about Obamacare and how it affects his practice. If you'd like to join in on the broadcast and ask Dr. Danuka a question, the number is 605-4567, 605-4567. So let's, before, before we even touch Obamacare, uh, Dr. Danuka, let's talk about health care in this country as it was before this piece of legislation. There were still problems and what were the problems, and what do you think should have been done to address those problems pre-Obamacare? So uh, let me just say one thing first, Dan. Uh, this is a long topic, and uh, I have talked about this uh, on Carl Linda's show over several episodes. I will try to summarize them and cover as much as I can in a limited time. So from that perspective, uh, if we go from pre-Obamacare days. Of course, we had problems. It was not a perfect system. Question we have to ask is, why were there problems? And is it possible to have a 100% perfect system or not? So, some of the problems which were the arguments used for the passage of this law were, number one, there are almost 40 million or so uninsured people in America, which is unacceptable on a humane ground. And we will go through one of uh, all of these issues one by one. Second argument was the cost of health care is rising rapidly, causing people to go into bankruptcies or inability to obtain health care to stay healthy and it is destroying our economy. That was the arguments given by the proponents of the law. Third argument was that despite of all this cost, quality of health care and quality of uh, our health as a nation is worse than many other countries. So let's take it one by one. First one was 40 million or so uninsured. Those are the government stats or various other studies have shown that. And the major reason for the passage of law was that it's humane to cover everyone and it's a shame that such a rich and great country like USA does not provide health care to 100% people unlike Sweden or uh, Norway or France or England where there is a universal health care. But isn't it true, doctor, that while we, we didn't have health insurance for everybody, no one was denied medical care, were they? There is a law called EMTALA, Emergency Medical uh, something, uh, Emergency Medical Act. I don't remember exact the details of the words. What that means is no hospital can deny emergency care to anyone who needs it, irrespective of their ability to provide for the health care. In addition, we have Medicare, we have had Medicare or Medical in United in California and several other government programs which covered most of the uninsured. So they were getting health care. But yes, there is a reality that some of the people fall through the cracks when they were not too rich to be able to afford health care and they were not too poor to be eligible for Medicaid. And some of those people fell through the cracks. And some of the people who had previous pre-existing conditions could not qualify for an insurance. And that was a certain problem which we needed a solution to. And there was some good solution to that. But isn't it also true, Doctor, that there were plenty of people, for for example, people who are in their 20s mm -hmm. who may work at a – like I knew a gal who worked as a waitress at a restaurant and she worked for a chain and they provided an opportunity mm -hmm. for health insurance. It was like $200 a month. She chose not to pay it because she's a healthy and young. Yeah. What weren't, weren't a lot of those 40 million people in that category? They you're, just didn't want health insurance? You're absolutely right. And that's what brings me to present day, that this, this was passed so the 40 million people can be insured. 
Now, since the passage of law, three, four years or so later, hundreds and hundreds of millions, almost a billion have been spent to make exchanges and to promote the enrollment. However, by government's own stats, only 8 million or so have signed up or maybe 10, 12 million if you include the states. My question is, which I have not seen being addressed anywhere is, why are the other 30 million not signing up? There yeah. is a discrepancy there. There is a disconnect there. And we don't know of that 8 million or 12 million, whichever the figure you want to use, how many of those were people who actually lost their previous program <laughs> Absolutely and were right. already insured. Absolutely right. McKesson did a study uh, and they found, uh, I'm sorry, McKenzie did a study, not McKesson, and they found that that was a couple of months ago, two-thirds of the people who signed up for new law healthcare were previously insured because either wow. they lost their insurance, it was not available, or <laughs> the previous insurance cost went to a high, so they couldn't afford it. So, well, let me let me let me sum this up as if I'm understanding what you're saying, and we're talking to Dr. Payush Danuka, a local physician here in Reading. We spent almost a billion dollars setting this thing up, and of the people who signed up for it, what percentage already had health insurance? Uh, estimates were two-thirds. Two-thirds. That's I don't see that being reported in the mainstream media. A couple of months ago, there was a study by this group which found at that time total enrollment was 5 million, and this study showed 3 million or so had were already insured. It has not been updated since then, but... As the numbers come, we will know better, but so far that's the best estimate available. It has been buried. And my question is, if you see by that estimate, if four or five million new people signed up out of 40 million or so, then why are the other 90% not signing up? Someone well, answered that question. I, I don't know. No one has answered that question. And hmm. the, interestingly, no one has actually questioned that. No one has raised that question. It's missing. This is my suspicion. My suspicion is that of those 90%, one third or so are probably illegal. Yes. So they may not be eligible for subsidies. Or they're, yeah, okay. Number two, one third or so left are probably eligible for other government programs like Medi-Cal or Medicare, but uh, they may not be eligible because of, uh, I'm sorry, they are eligible, but they have not signed up for some other reason, whether it's because of a mental illness or whether because of uh, their lack of concern for it. I don't know. Uh, this yeah. is just, I'm just my, this is my estimate. This is my guess. But I feel there's a large number of people who have not signed up, have not signed up because they don't want to report their income. I see. I see. Because if you see, there is a lot of underground economy sure. in this country, right? Yes. Fortunately, we are not like Greece or some third world countries where 90% of economy is underground. Right. And uh, most people pay taxes here. However, the lot of economy here where people don't pay their taxes. And our government is actually punishing the hardworking people, giving them more and more disincentive to report their income. Yes. And if they sign up for this, they have to report their income and they have to produce all those things and they get mm. taxed higher than they can get the subsidies for. Somebody in right mind doesn't want to do that. Mm. So they just pay the fine. This is my suspicion. Uh, Dr. Danuka, how specifically will Obamacare, once it's, you know, I know we keep delaying it and, 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 and there are things that have yet to kick in, but once it is kicked in and is in its full glory and hopefully – one day we can repeal it and, and defund it, but assuming that it goes through, how what's going to be the biggest impact on you as a physician in your quest to treat your patient? So the uh, so the we have to figure out what's the real reason behind it. If because even government own estimate just to complete the previous thought estimated that even after ten years, the number of uninsured will remain thirty to forty million. Yes. So clearly that was not the reason to do that. Right. And we will talk about the cost also that actually controlling the cost was not the reason and nor has it panned out because the cost of private insurance has gone up up to 20 to 40% in all the markets. 
However, the pur- and that what your question brings me to the actual purpose of it. Okay. The purpose of this law was to control the economy and control the people. Wow. Well, it's one-sixth of our economy, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. So if yeah. you control the economy, you control the people. Number two, wow. the core concept, core concept of this law is individual mandate. We have seen Obama repeatedly delayed or exempted certain sections from this law. And I don't know, I think last, last one was like, at least it was, I think it was 10, 20, 30, 40, something like that. Total delays and exemptions. Yes. Right? They yes. exempted the big companies for certain requirements. They exempted the Congress. They exempted big unions. They exempted yeah. insurance companies. They even exempted that, uh, the, okay, fine, if you do not uh, meet the individual uh, minimum requirements for uh, the insurance uh, uh, coverage, like if you don't cover this or that, even then you can keep it, right? If you right. Tried. But it's the beauty of the thing is one thing Obama adamantly refused to delay or exempt was individual mandate. Hmm. Why? Because this is the first time in this nation's history the government has become the owner of an individual, hmm. individual's life. How? So far, all the taxation was levied on an economic activity. Whether it's an earning, whether it's a sale, whether it's an owning of property, right? Yes. Individual mandate says that you have to buy something. Oh, it's terrible. And pay the penalty if you don't. Yes. Even if you have no economic activity. So buy. So by the mere act of living or breathing, yes, president or the government has a right to take away your property. And and doctor, I love the way you put it. It's the first time that they've owned an individual, and it is clearly a tax. That's the reason the Supreme Court upheld it, called it a tax. So really, this opens the door, does it not, for the government? To do anything. Yes, it's like... If, if they can tax you because you don't purchase something, they can tax you for any reason. It's like Caesar saying that so far, government owned a portion of your money or your property. Now, this is like saying that Caesar owns you just because you live. Even if you don't do anything, just the mere act of living and breathing means that you are owned by the Caesar and you must pay as something to caesar in order to exist oh this is this is amazing uh, dr payush Danuka is our guest i want to take some calls for you doctor if you don't mind sure. 605-4567 605-4567 let's go to paul paul you're on hey good afternoon folks good afternoon Hello. good afternoon paul okay. Okay, well, I guess I'm going to present a uh, contrarian view. I guess my, my politics are a bit more progressive, although I have to say that back in my uh, younger conservative days, I think I'd be listening to Dan's show a lot. I think he does a good job up here doing a lot of the national and, and local type stories. Um, I do have some disagreements on the Affordable Care Act. Um, first of all, I think that there was a statement made, which I think is false, that anybody here you know, in the United States won't be denied coverage, and that's only true for emergency type incidents but for the two biggest killers we have cancer and heart disease you cannot go into an emergency room without insurance and expect to be treated you get you know a pain pill and you know you go home and make your uh, make your death plans accordingly or you go pay you know 30 or 50 thousand dollars for treatment that's why we have tens of thousands of people every year dying for lack of health coverage so i think that statement that was made previously was totally um, inaccurate well, let's let's take one point at a time here, Paul. Doctor, Can, do you agree with that? Uh, actually, I made it very clear, Paul, that emergency treatment was covered. I don't know if you missed that. I made it very no, clear. I, I heard that emergency treatment was covered, and I said most for most other things, most people qualified for some or other kind of government plans or some other plans. But yes, and I also made it very clear that there were some people who fell through the cracks. I, uh, yeah, I, 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 hope I heard, heard that, that. doctor. Um, I, I, I think you maybe maybe overstated the fact. I would say most fall through the cracks. Uh, I know some people personally who do that. Um, Medicare and Medicaid, you, if you're poor, 
you do not, a lot of people who are working poor do not have access to that. You have to have dependent children or a disability to qualify. So if you're like homeless and you're living out in the street and you happen to be single with no dependents, you do not qualify uh, up until now through Obamacare before you do not qualify for Medicaid. You, you realize that, right? So uh, the actual facts are before the Obamacare was passed, maximum estimates have been approximately 10 to 12 percent people fell through those cracks mm -hmm. uh, and 40, 40, 40 in, in the country no no 40 million or so were the uninsured and mm -hmm. estimates were of those 10 percent one third or so actually were not eligible for any of these programs and fell through the cracks so i i think you either i'm not explaining it very well or we're missing something in the picture because yes there were people were the majority certainly not there probably were approximately three to four percent who fell through those cracks who were not eligible for any program let me kind of jump in here between uh, what paul's saying and what dr danuka is saying let's assume paul you are correct and I, and I have no reason to believe that you're not why don't we just address that why why introduce this massive legislation that literally takes over a sixth of our economy? Why don't we find those people who are falling for the, through the cracks and, and specifically come up with a plan or a program that would cater to their needs instead of just this massive overhaul? Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. And I guess when you go back to the elections, it wasn't just Obama. It was Hillary. I mean, health care in 2008, health care reform was, was a big topic. And as a progressive, at least more of a progressive, here's, here's the deal, and I'll put it back at you and see what you think, and, and the doctor as well. Um, you know, from a progressive point of view, the really ultra-left was single-payer system, single, you know, simple like um, Canada, some other countries. Um, Hillary Care, which is like a, more like Germany, was more like a non-profit but private insurance kind of a thing. The only, the, 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 the most far right you can go and still have universal coverage was basically the Republican health care plan alternative uh, to Hillary Care in the 90s, which was basically Obamacare. It's, it was actually developed by Republicans and the Heritage Foundation in the 80s and 90s. So Obama actually went way to the right of himself and his party and picked the Republican plan of the 1990s as his universal health care plan. So I guess my question to you, Dan, and you know, see what you think about it, is why does it get called socialist when, you know, Guys like Newt Gingrich and Bob Dole and, and those guys, you know, not, not that long ago, John Boehner, this is the plan they supported, you know, initially, a mandate to get private insurance as, as, as universal coverage back in the 90s. Well, I'll, I'll tell you my understanding of it, and Dr. Thrall, let you respond. The, the plan that the Heritage Foundation endorsed was administered much like Mitt Romney's plan on a state level. And I don't know of any Republican who's ever endorsed a federal a program to the magnitude of Obamacare. There are some on the Republican side who have endorsed the the mandate and the and the you know the the uh, preconditions. Uh, you can't turn anybody down for preconditions. There are elements of Obamacare that were endorsed. Frankly, uh, Mitt Romney's plan in Massachusetts obviously mirrors Obamacare in many ways, but never on this one size fits all for the federal government vantage point. Now, doctor, what, what, what's your thought? So, Paul, I'm not here to defend Mitt Romney or Boehner or Newt Gingrich or anyone else, nor do I care about any one of their plans. For me, the question is very simple. Who is going to dictate our economic activity, which is a fundamental economic activity, health care? Is it going to be me as a patient? Or is it going to be me as a doctor? Or is it going to be my patient or my doctor? Or is it going to be someone else? And if it is someone else, then who is it going to be? Someone who I can talk with? Someone who can I can go to home with? Someone in the county or city or state, capital or Washington, D.C.? Paul, my plan would be to let the individual communities decide at a grassroots level, at a city level, county level, state level. Let the cities decide how to take care of their patients who are uninsured or the counties. Because farther away we go from our community, less the control we have. 
Mm-hmm. Let me believe let me tell you what I believe in. I believe in what Jesus said that what you do unto the least of my brothers you do it to me. So I believe that as a ethical and moral society we have the moral responsibility to take care of those who are not in a position to take care of themselves specifically children elderly disabled pregnant women or who have fallen through the cracks however who is it going to be paul is it going to be you and the people around you or is it going to be some bureaucrat sitting thousands of miles away from you who will you cannot reach at all that's the key question yeah. i understand uh, doctor, let me let me give let me give paul an opportunity to respond to that paul you want to do take that no i i i hear what the doctor is saying and you know it it sounds really good to do that on the on the county state or grassroots level but i guess my response to the good doctor would be is before obamacare got implemented we had that opportunity for decades and did that happen no um in the counties the states did not take hold of that and as a result we have a healthcare problem that no other industrialized country has 40 to 51 million uninsured depending on which study you use another 30 40 million that are basically underinsured or almost not insured because they have deductibles of $10,000 or higher so if you're a middle class guy making 40 50,000 and you have a couple of kids that's basically the same as having no insurance at all because that's that's more than your annual salary left over so we have several problems in this country not only number of, of without insurance but we have the worst insurance coverage of anybody in any modern nation and to have 5000 10000 annual deductibles and then limitations on care the look at the problem i have with obamacare is even some of the private insurance policies they have i mean they're better than the crap that was offered before pardon my french but still any any annual deductible that's more than $2000 would be almost criminal in any other country that's just more than you can than a lot of middle, low to middle class income people can pay and here we have tens of millions on 5 to 10,000 annual deductibles carrying a worthless piece of plastic in their wallet claiming they have insurance coverage when in reality they don't you're absolutely right paul there are so many underinsured people most of the government plans like medicaid are really worthless and my concern here is that we are becoming a country like a third world country i came from india where in theory everybody was insured by the government because government was supposed to provide healthcare to each and every one in reality nobody got the care you are comparing these industrialized nations to america we forget that america is a huge country let's compare apples and apples let's compare america with the similar size population of china india indonesia mexico big countries Let's not compare America with Sweden, Norway, whose population is smaller than some of the counties in America, because large population presents significant problem, much more complicated than a smaller nation, and the solutions we provide as a large nation are even more complicated. Sometimes the unintended consequences for that make it worse. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm going to have to jump in here. This is a fascinating conversation. But we're out of time. Book of love is long and boring. No one can live to dance. It's full of charts and facts and figures and instructions for dancing. 